and uh, today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 3 and Servants of Christ. And uh, let's, let me lead us in prayer as we come to God's Word, and because uh, we know that, uh, as we saw in the previous weeks, we need God's Spirit to help us uh, to understand, believe, live out uh, what we hear from God's Word. So let's pray and ask for God's Spirit to help us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have uh, revealed yourself through your Son and his death on the cross. We pray now that your Spirit would be at work among us. We pray that your Spirit would help me to teach your word faithfully and clearly. Help me to lay no other foundation but Christ and him crucified. And we pray that you would be with each one of us as we listen to your word. May your Spirit give us faith, give us uh, understanding, and may you give us the will to live out what you say in your word that we may grow to maturity in the Lord Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, godly leaders lead people into godliness. Ungodly leaders lead people into ungodliness. Uh, so wisely said, a mentor of mine uh, back in Australia, what he meant was that the, the character and the convictions of a church leader can have either a wonderfully positive effect or disastrous consequences for the people that they lead. Uh, this week saw the death of John Shelby Spong. Uh, he was a bishop in the Episcopal Church in America for 24 years. Uh, he embraced liberalism, uh, which essentially meant that he denied the teachings of the Bible. He denied the possibility of a supernatural God who intervened in our world. He denied the incarnation of Jesus. He denied the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, he denied uh, the authority of the Bible as the word of God and its relevance for today. And uh, more and more, instead of those things, he embraced the progressive values of his culture. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, baptism, yearly baptisms in his diocese shrunk by 43.5% during his time as bishop. And it was leaders like John Shelby Spong that were a big reason why uh, the Episcopal Church in America has continued its, its downward plunge of denying biblical teaching. But of course, not only do such leaders hurt the church, they also divide the church too. And uh, right now, the wider Anglican communion, including Malaysia, West Malaysia, has, has broken communion with the Episcopal Church in America because of their false teachings. Now, apart from false teach, blatant false teachers like John Shelby Spong, there are many other ways that Christian leaders can harm the church and divide the church. You know, leaders who don't preach the gospel, leaders who don't disciple their members, leaders who, whose character compromises their message, leaders who are more concerned with, uh, well, being influential and respected and, and having uh, a large following than they really are in following Jesus. But on the other hand, godly leaders who are humble, sacrificial, who proclaim Christ and his cross, well, they can have a remarkably good impact in building the church to maturity in Christ. Now, my mentor was very wise. Godly leaders lead people into godliness. Ungodly leaders lead people into ungodliness. And our topic today is Christian leaders and Christian ministry. And my aim for us today is to see what godly Christian leadership, what godly Christian ministry looks like uh, so that we will seek such leaders for our church. Well, before we come to 1 Corinthians 3, let's just remind ourselves of the context. And we saw in chapter 1 that the Corinthian church was, uh, in a sense, a very spiritual church. Paul thanked God in chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, that in every way they were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift. They were a gifted church. God had enriched them with his grace. But they were far from a perfect church. 
And we've seen in chapters 1 to 4, Paul has been addressing the issue of divisions in the church. They were divided. One was saying, I follow Paul, or another, I follow Apollos, I follow Kephas, I follow Christ. They boasted of him. They considered the most uh, impressive leader, and they formed factions and parties supporting their leader against the rest. And each party, I guess, was thinking to themselves, I'm better than you. And it fueled division, jealousy, strife in the church. And we've seen that, that Paul recognised that uh, the issue of divisions pointed to a deeper problem in the Corinthian church, a, a problem with understanding and living out the gospel. They were embracing the wisdom of the world, which esteemed power and eloquence instead of God's wisdom uh, shown in the foolish cross. They were looking to their own eloquence and power instead of the powerful working of God's Spirit to transform people. They had misunderstood the gospel, and in particular, the centrality of the cross. But having already now uh, addressed their misunderstanding of the gospel, their, their displacement from the, of the cross from centre, now he turns in chapter 3 to their misunderstanding of ministry. He begins with a wake-up call, point one. Grow up, don't be infants. Grow up, don't be infants. The Corinthian church and their leaders were boasting of how spiritual they were because of their gifts and eloquence and their worldly wisdom. But Paul offers a different perspective on what this church is like. He says, verse 1, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. As infants in Christ, despite their claims to be spiritual, they were, in fact, unspiritual. Despite their claims to be mature, they were but children. They were infants in the faith. Yes, they were Christians. They were in Christ. He addresses them as brothers and sisters in verse 1. They believed the gospel. But there was a disconnect between the gospel that they believed and the life they were living. They were acting like people of the flesh. They were living like people who didn't have the Spirit of God. They were living according to the desires of their sinful nature. In other words, though they were in reality Christians, they were living like non-Christians. Now, I think this is helpful for us because it reminds us that what makes someone a mature Christian, a spiritual Christian, if you like, is not what gifts they have. It's not about how much knowledge they have or how many followers they have or whether they can speak in tongues or whether they are running a successful ministry. Those are not the markers of a spiritual person. A spiritual person is a Christian who has the Spirit of God and is living out the Gospel. The Corinthians had all those things, but they were in fact children. They needed to grow up. Because they were living like unbelievers. Now, how did Paul know that they were so immature? Well, firstly, it showed in how they were responding to his teaching. Look at verse 2. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Now, as many of you know, uh, my wife and I recently welcomed our fourth child. And uh, that means my wife has the, has the privilege, challenge or so, of breastfeeding all throughout uh, all the day and the night. And I'm sure she can't wait for the day uh, when we can feed him solid food, or even when uh, he grows up and he can feed himself food, and she can sleep through the night again. Well, that's a little bit like what the Corinthians were like. They, they were still stuck on milk. They, they were not interested in understanding the scriptures deeply. They were not interested in Bible studies or theological reflection. They were the sort of people who wanted short, simple, basic, bottom line. In short, they wanted milk. I remember one member of our church who attended some of our Easter services and uh, they gave some feedback on the services. The one piece of feedback they gave was, why are the sermons longer than 10 minutes? That reveals a lot, doesn't it? A, a Christian, though, who, who doesn't want to think 
A, a Christian who doesn't want to be challenged. A, a Christian who just wants a simple motivational talk will only ever remain an infant in the faith. Because the sign of the mature Christian is that they will want solid food. That, that they want to plumb the depths of God's word. They want to think deeply on the gospel. They won't be wanting the bare minimum. They'll be wanting to know God deeply. See, the Corinthians, they were on milk. They were fleshly, worldly, acting like pagans. And Paul explains further in verse 3. He says, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Paul's saying there's nothing particularly Christian about their behavior at all. Their jealousy and their divisions as they lined up under their favorite teachers was just like the world around them. It could have been any uh, office workplace. It could have been any kind of political party gathering. And Paul is saying what makes someone spiritual, what makes someone mature as a Christian, is that they understand the gospel and they live it out in their life. It's not about gifts, abilities, eloquence, power, influence. It's about your character. And the Corinthians didn't have it. They were full of jealousy, strife. They're acting in a merely human way, according to their sinful nature. Their focus was wrong. They were focusing on their leaders instead of focusing on Jesus. They were creating rivalries with one another instead of working together as fellow believers. In summary, both their knowledge of the gospel and the quality of their life didn't match the profession of their faith. They were children, infants in the faith, on milk. They needed to grow up. Well, what about us this morning? Are we growing in the Christian faith? Do you have a desire to dig deep into God's word, to really know what the Bible is saying for yourself? Uh, are you content with just the basics? Or do you want to know more? And not just know more. But are you living it out? Does it show in your life? Or as you think about your life, is it just like the lives of those around you in the workplace or the non-Christian relative? We need to grow up in Christ. Well, in verses 5 to 9, Paul addresses uh, this proud and divisive perspective that they have of their leaders. And now we're at point two, where servants... God causes the growth. Where servants, God causes the growth. Verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom he believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Paul's saying there's, there's no point boasting about your leaders. You know, I follow this leader. As if a, 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 it's all about how great and impressive their ministry is. Because Christian ministry is not about people. It's not about the leaders. It's about Jesus. Christian leaders are just servants. Their, their job is to point to him, not to point to themselves. They're, they're to want Jesus to be glorified. They're not to steal the glory for themselves. Moreover, Paul reminds us here that uh, we are servants that Jesus has appointed. God, in his grace, gives the gifts. He gives the opportunities to be a Christian leader. It's not something to boast about. Now, I think it's really important to hear this reminder very regularly. I, I certainly need to be reminded of it because it is easy, isn't it? So easy for a right desire to serve Jesus in our life, to glorify him, to turn into a wrong desire to succeed in ministry for the sake of self. I, I find it can be just so subtle we're still doing the same ministry. From the outside, it looks the same. We're even sacrificially doing it. But in the heart, a button has been pressed. The motivation has changed. It's no longer about him. It's about me. Not about his glory. It's about my success. I know my own heart. I know how 
often I have these mixed motives where I start looking at myself instead of looking at Jesus. What about you? I think we need to be reminded of this again and again. Who are we? We're just servants. Jesus is the master. God is the one who grows the church. It's all about him, not about us. So verse 6, Paul continues, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. See, if we've understood chapter 2, that apart from God powerfully working in us by his Holy Spirit, we'll never come to accept the gospel or believe it or live it out. If we've grasped that, then we'll know that growth in God's, growth in maturity, growth in God's church, it's entirely God's work, isn't it? Now, God in his grace involves us in his work. One uh, plants and other waters as the gospel is faithfully preached by different people. But in the end, it's God who gives the growth. It's God who works by his spirit. And therefore, whoever we are, however God, much God uses us, we are nothing. He is everything. Because he is the one who brought the growth. And not only that, but it means that as gospel workers, we're not in competition trying to outdo one another. At least we're not meant to be. We're meant to be on the same team with the same goal because we're not thinking about ourselves. We're serving King Jesus. We want people to know him and love him, whether or not they notice us. Verse 8, he says, He who plants and he who waters are one. Each one will receive his wages according to his labour. See, he's saying we have the same goal. We have the same purpose. But Paul doesn't want to deny the importance of each Christian leader doing their job faithfully. They are to do it and they will receive their wages. But they're to do it together, not in competition. Verse 9, he says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building now, isn't that an amazing truth? Those who preach the gospel here are called God's fellow workers. It's God's work. God's growing the church. He's doing it by his spirit as the gospel is preached. But in his grace, he chooses to use broken, sinful people. He involves us in his work. We, we can be fellow workers with him as we labour with him to preach the gospel. So that was the Corinthians' second misunderstanding. Not only had they misunderstood the gospel, but they had actually misunderstood Christian leadership as well. Ministry. Ministers are not competitors. They are just servants of Jesus. They're co-workers with God. They have the common goal of growing God's people. The Corinthians' focus was wrong. God owns the field the church. God appoints the workers, the ministers. God gives the growth. God deserves the glory. It's about God, not us. We're nothing. We're just servants. Well, that brings us to our final point then. Uh, be careful how you build. Be careful how you build. Now, the fact that God is sovereign at the fact that he is the one who appoints the workers and brings the growth, that it doesn't mean that what the servants do doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that uh, because ultimately God brings the growth, that it doesn't matter what Christian leaders preach or whether they bother to preach at all. Uh, in these verses, the builders are Christian leaders like Paul and Apollos, leaders who preach the gospel. God's building, we're told, is the church. And the goal of Christian leaders, the goal of Christian ministry, is to build the church so that it's no longer in infancy, but it grows to maturity. And such, because such leaders who do this, these servants, are God's fellow workers, they need to be faithful builders who handle God's word correctly. Because the way that God chooses to grow the church is through the faithful preaching of the gospel by his servants.
So Paul says in verse 10, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Paul, the master builder, he started the Corinthian church as he preached the gospel. He laid the foundation, which was Christ and the gospel. But after him, other leaders had come to Corinth, preaching to the congregation. They were building upon the foundation that he had laid. And Paul's point here is that leaders who are building the church through their preaching must take care how they build. They must build correctly. They must preach the right message, the right gospel, because only that will build the church properly and God will hold them accountable. Paul continues in verse 11, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. As we saw in the previous chapters, faithful Christian ministry is about preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. That must always remain the centre and the foundation of everything we preach. We must resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross, the gospel, Jesus Christ must remain the foundation of our faith. We must strive to proclaim him, even as we trust that God will bring the growth. There is no room for another message, another form of preaching that doesn't involve Christ and the cross, another focus other than Jesus. And this matters a great deal because there's going to be a judgment day. There will be a day when God will hold Christian leaders to account for their ministry. There will be a day when he assesses our work, assesses our ministry. Verse 12. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So Paul's reminding us here that what we preach will either lead people to salvation, or it will lead them to destruction. If we lay the right foundation, if we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, then people will be saved. And such leaders who faithfully preach will be rewarded. But we're warned also, those who do not preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, if they build with the wrong materials, the wrong theology, the wrong understanding of scripture, the wrong gospel, well, the work may not survive the judgment day. Sure, there might be many people in their, their church building, but it doesn't mean they'll all be Christians. It doesn't mean they'll all be saved at the end. The work might be burnt up. They might believe the gospel is the leader, but maybe not those they ministered to. So what does verse 15 mean? Let's look at it again more closely. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. That he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, this verse certainly cannot be used to support the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The idea that believers with unconfessed sin would go to a place called purgatory to suffer for a while until God deems that they have been purified enough to go to heaven. This verse is not about purgatory at all. The verse is reminding us that how Christian leaders build is very important. It's possible to, to be a Christian leader, but to do the ministry in such a way that although you're a Christian and you're saved, your ministry is fruitless. Or worse, your ministry actually hinders people from trusting in Jesus or destroys people's faith or takes people away from Christ. So Don Carson writes this. This ought to be extremely sobering to all who are engaged in vocational ministry. 
It is possible to build the church with such shoddy materials that at the last day you have nothing to show for your labour. People may come, feel helped, join in corporate worship, serve on committees, teach Sunday school classes, bring their friends, enjoy fellowship, raise funds, participate in counselling sessions and self-help groups, but still not really know the Lord. If the church is being built with large portions of charm, personality, easy oratory, positive thinking, managerial skills, powerful emotional experiences and people smarts, but without the repeated, passionate, spirit-anointed proclamation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we may be winning more adherents than converts. You see what he's saying? You can be very busy as a Christian minister. A church can be very packed with events and meetings. You read the AGM reports, it's full of contents. But it's, there's no substance. There's no reality to it at all. There's no real faith. Because the faithful preaching of Christ and the cross has been absent from it all. It really troubles me to think just how many churches, even Anglican churches, perhaps even in our diocese, that may be like that, busy, full of activity, no spiritual reality, no Jesus Christ and Him crucified, no solid food from God's Word. See, as leaders of God's church, we must make sure we are never distracted from the main game. We must preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We must preach the, the Scriptures faithfully. We must feed the congregation, not just with milk, but solid food. Unless we have the cross, unless we have the Gospel, unless we have deep theological reflection from the Scriptures, we should not be surprised if our churches don't grow. We shouldn't be surprised if our churches are filled with rivalries and divisions. We shouldn't be surprised if, if our character is not being transformed. And we shouldn't be surprised if the work, the ministry work, doesn't last the fires of judgment on the last day. It's Incredibly important, isn't it, that Christian leaders faithfully build according to God's design. Well, Paul closes by reminding how high the stakes are. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple, that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Here Paul describes the church as the temple. Not the building, of course. He's talking about the believers. And just as God was extremely concerned with the holiness of his physical temple in the Old Testament, so God is even more concerned with his spiritual temple, the church. And Paul wants us to understand what a serious thing it is to stumble other believers, to destroy God's church by failing to preach the gospel, by preaching heresy, by running programs that don't grow people in the word of God, to destroy God's church with gossip and jealousy and prayerlessness and rivalries. Paul puts it so strong, doesn't he? Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. I really fear for what was coming for John Shelby as he met his Lord. Well, if you're listening today and you are a Christian leader as I am, this is a warning that you and I need to take serious stock of. We must not make the mistake of the Corinthian church to sideline the cross, to adopt a distorted view of 
Christian leadership. We must take care that we are utterly committed to preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We must be utterly committed to give solid food and not just milk. We must make certain that we never empty the, the cross of Christ of its power and so hurt the church. It's a serious matter to be a Christian leader. These truths ought to prompt serious reflection and repentance. They certainly have for me this week. Now, it's not all bad news. There's also the positive side to these verses, of course, as well. Verse 14 says, If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive his reward. Yes, faulty ministry will be met with the judgment of God. But there's a reward for faithful ministry. We're not told what it is, actually. Uh, perhaps it's the joy of seeing the fruit of our work, seeing those that we ministered to in eternity with Jesus Christ. We don't know. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. But the point is, just as flawed ministries will be judged, faithful ministries will be rewarded. Take care how you build. Well, as we conclude, I want to draw out a few implications of this passage for the whole church. I realise that not everyone listening, uh, in fact, probably most of us who are listening, are not actually Christian leaders ourselves. So here's three takeaway points. Firstly, choose your leaders carefully. Choose your leaders carefully. We see here that Christian leaders can either bring us to Christ or away from him. They can build the church or they can destroy the church. And so that means we must be very careful that we choose the right leaders for our church. We must be clear about the kind of leaders that we need. We must be reminded it's not about eloquence or gifts or influence or status. It's not about how many programs they run. What we're looking for in a Christian leader is their message and their character. Will they preach Jesus Christ and him crucified? Will they give solid food based in the word of God? Will they conduct themselves humbly as servants of Christ, not there to bring glory to themselves, but there to bring glory to Jesus? That's the kind of leaders we're looking for, for our church. And very often the, church, the leaders that we're looking for are the leaders that we will get. Secondly, pray for your leaders and encourage them in what matters. Pray for your leaders and encourage them in what matters. So as we look at this passage and we see that Christian leaders actually have an immense responsibility, I think that should move us to pray, don't you think? I would love you to pray for me, to pray for the other pastors in St. George's. Pray for us that we would preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Pray that we would be godly and live out the gospel. Pray that we would have this humility seeing ourselves only as servants, there to shine the spotlight on Jesus. And even as you pray, encourage when you see those things happening. Don't just look out for, oh, he, that was a, a, an interesting sermon or something like that. But say, thank you for preaching Christ. Thank you for preaching the cross. That will encourage the leaders to do those things more and more. And finally, don't overly exalt leaders. Remember they're only servants. Don't overly exalt leaders. Remember they're only servants. So of course it's right to honour our leaders and those who teach the word of God. But we must always remember that God will hold the leaders of his church to account. And so we must never fall into the trap of so elevating or so overly respecting our leaders that in our minds we think that they can never do anything wrong. Or to think that the ministry is all about them because they're the leader. When we start thinking like that, we start making excuses for their mistakes and we start feeding their egos. We must remember that Christian leaders are no more than servants. They will make mistakes and it should never be about them. So don't elevate them too high. Respect them but not over God. Always remember, they're God's servants. It's God's church. God gives the growth. 
And so if there's any success in the ministry, the glory and the praise should always go to him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the reminder this morning that you are the one who grows your church. You are the one who sends leaders. You are the one who grants growth as you work by your Spirit. Father, we thank you for the reminder that Christian leaders are but servants, there to preach Christ, there to give solid food from your Word, that the church may be built to maturity. Lord, we pray for the leaders in our own church. We pray that you would enable us to be the kind of leaders of this chapter, faithful servants of Jesus, handling your word faithfully, building your church humbly. And Father, we pray uh, that you would give in each one of us a hunger for your word, for more than just milk. Help us to desire solid food. And we pray that as we do, you would grow us to maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we commit our church and the leaders into your hands. We pray that our church may truly glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray.